Well, thanks, everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, I think the reason that we're all here is, is mostly to figure out you know, what's possible to do right now with technology. What's the cutting edge, especially with this wide range of devices that we can do, that we have now, especially these things, right? Uh, what I thought might be an interesting way, too, to sort of look at that, or maybe look just a little bit ahead, is just to take a little bit of a peek into the future. Not too far into the future, and in fact, a lot of this stuff is like, like tomorrow kind of future, like, like stuff that's upon us that we need to prepare for right now. Uh, because it turns out that up until now, we've really been hurtling into this, uh, this period of science fiction, really. And I would say that, you know, for, for me, this sort of began uh, in 2007 when Steve Jobs took the stage and introduced these things, right? An iPhone that then, of course, changed and blew up the whole mobile world as we knew it. And for me, it was really the first time in my adult life that I really felt like my childhood vision of the future had come to pass. You know, and forget about the, the rocket cars and the jetpacks. Wow, here's a computer, a personal computer packed with sensors that uh, can do so much, changes everything. You know, I mean, that's why we're all here, it changes everything, it changes the whole nature of what's possible with computing, what's possible for interaction with, uh, with each other and with information, and I would say with other devices. And I think there's a lot to think about there, uh, but what's really been consuming me sort of recently is what's next? What comes after this mobile as we know it, that we're trying so desperately to sort of refine and get our arms around. What's coming around the corner? Uh, I'm interested in post-mobile. So um, if you'll come with me, let's get started. Because friends, I propose an expedition to the far corners of the tech universe, to the hazy hints of the technology that's coming just around the corner, so we can prepare now for these changes that are coming ahead real practical steps that we can take right now. You ready? All right, let's start with where we are right now. Uh, if we start here, what we'll find is, you know, we'll, we, we have the question of what is it that this new era of computing, this new class of devices, lets us do that we haven't been able to do before. We've been talking about personal computing since the days of disco, right? Since the early 80s. But in a very real way, this class of devices, uh, it's the first truly personal computer, you know? Not just because it's always with us, although that's part of it, but because it knows so much about us. We've loaded it by choice with personal information, and then it's packed with sensors to know tons about our immediate environment and to give context, as Kenneth was saying, uh, about, you know, about our environment to help us do more with our tasks and information. Right? So it's these, it's these sensors that give us superpowers. The device is packed with superpowers, and so therefore we have superpowers too. It's the sensors that give this context and insight to our information and tasks. I mean, look at what these things have. GPS, camera, microphone, these things that the web is just beginning to get access to, uh, as we heard from Max. Touch. Light detector, proximity detector, accelerometer, compass, you guys, a gyroscope? Wow, all the things that we can do with this. And what is it that that's doing? What's that that's sort of pushing the boundaries of, and frontiers of computing? How, how is it doing that? And what can we do with those things? Mobile is often considered the companion version, the light version to the real computing experience on the desktop. And I think that that's the wrong way to think about it. It's not how can I do less with mobile, it's how can I do more? Because these things can do more than the traditional computing devices that we've known before, right? A lot of times we think about sensors and designing for sensors in the context, particularly of GPS, and that's been really useful. It's changed a lot the way that we think about personal computing. You know, when's the next train leaving from the station closest to me? Where can I get a cup of coffee? And that's great. Uh, but I would encourage you to think about how can we do things not just with what's nearby, but often with what's directly in front of us, around us. Let's sort of start with a very simple example. Uh, Yahoo has a service called Into Now, or they acquired the service. Uh, it seems how Yahoo does everything these days. Uh, I don't have to. And, and what it is is it's basically a, uh, a media check in service, sort of Foursquare for TV. 
right, so I can share with my friends what I'm watching. The problem with sharing a TV show is that you kind of have to know the digital ID of the show, in a sense, right? The season number and episode number, not exactly stuff you're thinking about when you're watching TV. And so Into Now is kind of the shazam of television. It listens to about four seconds or so of your TV show, and it recognizes it. Aha! CSI Kansas City, season one, episode three. It understands that stuff. And one of the things that that, that 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 does is, A, it's, it's the identifying magic that sort of wowed all of us when we first saw Shazam for the first time, but it also speeds input, right? It saves me the effort of looking it up, figuring it out, typing it in. So sensors are something that can, A, speed input, but also make sense and interpret the environment around me. So that's taking the environment and interpreting it. You know, sort of just looking at where we are now with, with sensors. But there's also the opportunity, right, to transform reality. That's the promise of augmented reality, to add new layers of understanding and insight by adding new visuals to what we can see with our puny human eyes. Right? So I think we have to be careful to use augmented reality correctly. In a lot of ways, it's a solution looking for a problem. I think we've all seen these augmented reality demos that are like, yeah, that's kind of fun. I don't think I'd ever use it for anything, right? But there are a lot, so there are a lot of bad implementations uh, of augmented reality that we're seeing. Uh, something that looks cool, but that you actually wouldn't find useful day to day. There are a few areas, though, that have been quite compelling. And the first and perhaps most obvious one is games. So here's an app called Skinvaders, and it's a game that scans your face, uses the front-facing camera to turn your, your, your face into the, basically a board game where uh, aliens are uh, <coughs> invading your skin. Let's take a look. So what it does is it scans your face to sort of figure out the lay of the land, as it were, and then it starts trying to implant eggs in your face. Uh, she won, but she's still got an alien there sort of embedded in her in her uh, forehead. Oh, wow, all right, here we go. Lots of them going. Yeah. So here's this very sort of whimsical use of augmented reality, transforming my sort of sense of the environment to sort of play this, these games. Right? I mean, kids, this, this sort of stuff for kids, sort of triggering the imagination in our own imagination is sort of some one kind of very straightforward use of augmented reality that actually works, that actually people will continue to keep coming back to. One other sort of just quick example, though, is uh, this got a bit of uh, attention when it came out about a year ago, is WordLens. It's an augmented reality app that uses computer vision and optical character recognition to translate text in real time from one language to another. So I just point the camera at text in one language, and then it translates it live into text in another. No internet connection required or anything. You're never going to order the tongue by accident. Again, when you're, when you're traveling, the tripe will stay on the menu as it's supposed to. Hopefully avoid some potentially embarrassing situations along the way, too. So again, this is the thing that's really what it's doing is saving me the effort of input. This is something I could just type into Google Translate. But you know, it's sort of using the, basically the power of these devices that we already have in, the po in our pocket, using very sort of traditional software solutions, stuff that Evernote does all the time with photos that we upload, indexing the text on them, optical character recognition, but just sort of putting it all together to say, right, this is something that I can use to save time and actually give this almost magical experience, this lens on the world. We tend to think about augmented reality as being a visual thing. It turns out that there's some ways to uh, explore it from an audio perspective, too. So a group in Sweden that developed this app, called Table Drum, and it's, uh, it's basically what they call uh, augmented audio. And so it's a, it's a drum machine app. There are tons of these things in the app stores. Something that lets you, you know, choose some instruments, tap out a rhythm on the screen. It's a drum pad, right? So it does those things. But it does something more interesting, which is to use the microphone, again, this, this basic sensor that's in all of your phones, to listen for sounds in your environment and transform those into the drum machine, right? So what it does is it turns your desk into a drum machine. The logic is still happening on the, on the phone, but it's really just a speaker now, right? The entire interaction has moved off of the screen 
and onto the table, but it doesn't know the glass sound. So let's teach it the glass sound. Choose a symbol and put it into training mode. You guys ready? Yeah! You see what's happening here? The interaction isn't on the screen anymore. We go through our lives looking at these tiny little screens, ignoring the people we care about, the ones who interest us, the environment around us. And it's incredibly antisocial behavior because we're so absorbed in interacting with the screen. What happens when we stop designing for the screen and start designing for sensors? What happens is we can push our interactions into the environment around us. No UI required, or at least the UI that we create naturally. Right? And that natural interaction, that's the whole promise of what we've been calling natural gesture, stuff like connect, right? And we're seeing things, we're seeing connect expand not only from its game environment, where we all know it best, but it's beginning to be experimented with in other computing environments, unclear how it's going to be used exactly. Microsoft Research is starting to experiment with putting connect into displays, building it into uh, uh, laptops, and we're seeing some, some other things, too. It, like, for example, um, we, heard, uh, we heard earlier about Leap Motion, right? And Leap Motion is this incredibly detailed sensor. It goes in front of the device, or can be built into a device. It's basically like a super accurate connect. It can read, you know, things within millimeters. So it can read the tip of, your, of a pencil, your fingertip as you're working with it. This is a thing that launches this year in July. It's already been distributed to about 12,000 developers, lots of apps already sort of in beta on this thing. Asus, the computer and tablet maker, is, has committed to putting this into their devices. So you take things like Kinect, things like Leap Motion. These things are available now, like right here. We've been talking about this minority report thing for, what, 20 years? And now it's here in sort of really affordable consumer devices. This thing's going to be around 100 bucks. So this stuff is slated to go mainstream, like now, and, and of course, uh, Microsoft with Connect, as I mentioned, trying to figure out how to get their stuff into more consumer devices. They released an API about a month or two ago for, uh, to drive uh, Windows with Connect. And we'll see how that works. You know? Every new input is going to be the best thing at something and the worst thing at something else. The mistake is trying to replace the mouse one-to-one. -one, right? Nobody pretends that somebody's going to use this to mouse, and that's it new interactions are going to evolve. But I think what's really interesting, right, is that all these things point to, interact to interactions outside of the device itself. The device manages the logic, but the interaction happens somewhere else. I've been occupied with touch interfaces for the last five or six years, basically. And what I've found over time is that sometimes the best touch interface is no touch at all. You know? How can we save the user from even interacting with the screen or limiting it as much as possible? That's why there's been so much interest in barcodes and QR codes, obviously sort of a flawed interaction. But also computer vision, speech recognition, speech. Right around the corner, right? I mean, touch was sort of the first alternate input that really became mainstream, again, really sort of the iPhone and all the classes of devices that followed it really sort of ushered that in in a really big way. But, you know, we've got speech coming right around behind it. This stuff is still a little bit wonky. You know, Apple still calls Siri beta, and it feels like it. Natural gesture, you know, you don't want to run a nuclear power plant with Kinect, I don't think. But, you know, this stuff, you can see it. It's almost mature. All of these different things that, that we use to communicate with one another as human beings, Speech, natural gesture, facial recognition, touch, the machines are now able to recognize that that technology has been solved or nearly solved. And now it's up to us as the developers and designers to figure out what to do with it. It's a really exciting uh, opportunity, I think, because these are the things that we're going to have to start designing interfaces for, for speech, gesture, facial recognition, camera vision, designing for sensors instead of for the screen. It's here. And the thing is, we tend to think about designing for these things in isolation. Oh, here's a speech interface, here's a touch interface, here's a keyboard interface. I mean, one of the themes that we've heard earlier, to, you know, all throughout the day, is it's like, wow, you can't sort of assume that it's for anyone interface. 
So we have the challenge of designing for many, and the number of inputs are growing. You know, we heard Anna talk about that earlier today, right? Wow, these are the crazy interfaces we have to design for. They're going to get crazier, weirder. And again, it's the combinations that are especially intriguing. I think speech and gesture in particular will necessarily develop together. You've got to wave at the machine to let it know that you're going to start talking to it, start talking to it to let it know that you're going to wave to it. And you know what happens when you combine speech and gesture? This. Curriculum, rictus empra, expecto patronum. Yes. Spells, you guys. That's what we're working on right now. Talking, waving, working on objects at a distance, affecting information at a distance, with the apparent effect of magic. So, you know, and, and, and what, that, what that gets at, right, is sort of the Internet of Things, which is, again, this thing that we've been talking about a long time. Hey, we're going to be able to communicate with the physical world through, through the digital. Well, it's happening now. It's here. It's the, it's, it, and it's time to actually start doing it. So pushing sensors, as I said, lets us push our interfaces off the screen and into the world around us. And that's just the onboard sensors. That's what's happening right now just with this, the, these consumer devices that, you know, half the world now has. You know, so what happens when you start to move beyond those devices that we get for free? Stuff gets really interesting as engineers start creating custom sensors that talk to these gadgets, that lets a device talk to any arbitrary object. Things are especially interesting in that realm in the medical devices field. So medical device manufacturers have always been great at, at creating sensors, stuff to monitor our bodies, but terrible at creating interfaces for them. Crummy machines, bad UX. But what they've discovered is, hey, wait a second, everybody's already got a great machine with a great interface on it. So we can just focus on connecting our devices to those. And so you start seeing things like this. This is the Proteus Digital Health Feedback System. It's a pill that knows when it's been taken and reports about it. So check this out. There's a sensor about the size of a grain of sand that can go into a pill. And it's, you know, it's made of the same stuff that you'd find in a vitamin, some magnesium, some copper. And when it hits your stomach, it turns it into a battery just strong enough to send a weak signal out with its serial number. Right? And the people who use this wear a patch. It's a really weak signal, right? They wear a patch on their body. It's Bluetooth-enabled. It relays the information to your phone or tablet, which adds GPS and timestamp information, your own personal information, and sends that to your doctor. Hello! Cheap enough to put in a pill. It is becoming so trivially inexpensive to put a sensor on anything, and only slightly more expensive to put an internet connection on it, that we're able to do these trivial interventions that, in aggregate, make our life potentially, and if we do it right, much better. I was talking to another device manufacturer, who, medical device manufacturer, who makes a sensor for people with advanced pulmonary disease, people with really sick hearts. And so one of the early warning signs for this, if you're about to take a really bad turn, is a very slight change in blood pressure. So they've got this sensor that you actually embed in an artery in the heart, near the heart, in your body, which is great, it detects the change, but hard to read a sensor that's inside your body. So how do you get it out? Well, you touch your finger to a pad, and it downloads the information through your skin, talks to the tablet or your phone, and sends it to your doctor. You guys, this is like real tricorder stuff here, right? Really sort of groovy sci-fi technology we're talking about. And as sensors become more advanced and ever more cheaper, thanks to Moore's Law, and are trivially cheap now, we can do so much more. And it means that we can almost use just about any object or device not only to get information from it, but also for control. So it can control our devices, too. And this stuff can get kind of out of hand the more that these custom sensors get a little wacky. Here's one, literally, Mickey Mouse example. The Walt Disney World uh, company, the re their Disney research, came up with this late last year. It's called Botanicus Interacticus. Botanicus Interacticus is a new interactive plant technology. It requires no plant instrumentation. 
A simple electrode placed in the soil turns any plant into an expressive, multi-touch, gesture-sensitive control. You guys plant UI! You know you've been waiting for it. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, that feels good. Yeah, a little more of that. Oh, yeah. Oh, right there. Yeah. I have no idea why they built this thing. I don't know what they're doing. The, the theme parks, maybe? I don't, you know, I don't know. But the point is you can use anything as a controller now because you can put a sensor on just about anything, right? Even a cow. You know it's about the Swiss. The Swiss did this. They came up with a sensor that you can put inside a cow, detects when the cow is in heat, and then she texts the farmer. Texting when you're in heat, it sounds like friends of mine. And of course, because it's Switzerland, right, it, it, you can send the text in, in, in German or Italian or French because cow love knows no language boundary, friends. Uh, so forget about the Internet of Things, we've got the Internet of Bovines now. Um, so we've got this growing variety of sensors sharing data in all kinds of ways and even control with these devices that we all carry in our pocket now. And that's really, again, you know, I promised a little journey into the future, and this is just where we are now, right? This is the stuff that we should be doing right now, and many people are. Things that make sense of our immediate environment and let us act on them. But your device is not just a sensor for input, but also a broadcaster. So if we b embark on our mission with just one more quick hop, we get to mirroring. And for the most part, that simply means screen sharing. That's the whole idea behind, for example, Apple's AirPlay, right? Google's working on its own Apple or AirPlay-like technology. But the idea, right, you mirror your screen via an Apple TV or similar device to your TV set to share photos, to share videos. And that begins to make it social, not only with other people, but crucially with other devices. Right? So it's not just a sensor, your device broadcasts content to other dumb devices, like a TV set, becomes the sensor and receiver for those dumb devices. Samsung takes another approach. Instead of mirroring, they don't have quite the same tight ecosystem that Apple has. They say, you know what, well, maybe what we can do is we can make every TV smart. Love smart TVs, you guys, are going to be independent with their own, own operating system. Uh, who needs to mirror, they say, when everything can be a smart device? So you have things like, like this, the Samsung Smart TV. Hi, TV. Smart Hub. See that? This TV actually recognizes my voice and pulls up the Samsung Smart Hub, giving me instant access to my favorite apps like ESPN Sports Center. Yeah, I kind of hate that guy. You know what I mean? You guys know what I mean. Uh, so he's got this, this fancy TV with its own operating system and internet connection and its own Kinect style thing. And, uh, and that's the whole idea. It's like, well, let's make that smart. Let's make everything smart, right? And we've been hearing futurists talk about this, particularly with the kitchen. I'm not really sure what the deal is. This fascination with uh, the, uh, you know, the internet toaster and especially the internet refrigerator at CES in January. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the big electronics uh, uh, sort of festival conference uh, in Las Vegas, uh, Samsung released its T9000 refrigerator, an inter internet-enabled, Evernote-compatible, Evernote-syncing refrigerator. You know, it's a web browser, it's got all this stuff. And, um, you know, we, we heard earlier that, you know, everything you can put a screen on, we'll put a screen on it, we'll put a browser on it. That might be true, I hope not, because I don't think that's the way forward. For one thing, you know, how often do you replace your refrigerator? 15, 20 years? Well, good luck with your upgrades, right? It's like it's out of sync. That device is out of sync with the technology that we want to embed in it. But more important, you know, it's, it's really not about turning everything into a web, a web browser, a refrigerator into a web browser, or my coffee pot into a Twitter client. Like, I'm not quite sure that that's the right thing to do. Instead, to sort of go back to what I was talking about, trivial improvements. I think the secret is really more about how can we just make it a better appliance, a better refrigerator, a better microwave. I don't know about you guys, but my microwave oven is really a clock. I use it much more as a clock than as a microwave oven. It's a clock with an oven attached to it, right? How would an internet connection make that a better up microwave oven? How about if the clock was always right, you know? And just these little tiny improvements 
what some are calling mundane computing, are things that I think is really what about is, is about turning these things into really useful connected devices, not putting a screen on everything. What I'm trying to suggest throughout this talk is that it's not going to be about the screen. We've got to move our interactions off of the screen. So one other sort of drawback to this, too, is right, you know what, I've already got too many operating systems in my life. I don't want more of them. Everyone requires me learning new patterns, new systems, figuring out what I'm doing wrong to make the thing go. You know, I think that the question is, how do I go from a place like this to a place like this, right? So let's push a little further out into our mission and move out from sensors and mirroring, go a little further out to find remote control. I think part of maintaining our sanity is limiting the number of smart interfaces that we have to deal with. I mean, that's what's making us crazy as designers and developers, right? How many platforms do we have to design for? And frankly, it's getting that way for consumers, too. Too many technologies to learn. I think the key is to have a handful of smart devices that can control all the dumb devices in our lives. Drive everything, for example, with my phone or my tablet. That's possible to do with technologies like AirPlay, too, although you see limited examples of it, at least in that particular environment. Here's one example. Metal Storm Wingman is a game that uses the iPad to fly your plane on the TV. This is beyond mirroring, obviously. This is a, a generic device, the iPad, acting like a purpose-built controller or remote, working with a dumb device like the TV. So it's a little bit of broadcast, but it has this whole illusion of remote control over this dumb device, the TV. Um, like Samsung, of course, Microsoft is very interested in breaking Apple's potential grip on the living room, although that's very much up in play. So late last year, they introduced something they call Smart Glass, uh, which lets you control your Xbox with your phone or tablet, whether it's a Windows phone or iOS or Android, whatever. So here's how you control Internet Explorer on your Xbox. You use your phone as a trackpad to browse the web. And they have second screen experiences for TV and games, too. So it's a standard, at least for the Xbox ecosystem, that lets any device control it remotely. But this is an example of a smart device, a phone, sharing control with another smart device, the Xbox in this case. And that brings us to our next destination. So if we go a little bit further out here, beyond our solar system, beyond where we are now, we get to migrating interface. Uh, in all the previous cases, we've seen, for the most part, a single smart device controlling the display, either its own display or a remote display on a dumb device. Broadcast, right? But if we push that further and go out in a little bit further here, we get to migrating interfaces. And friends, here's where things get interesting. An important element of the near future will be more ambiguous control over the device that we've got, shared control among devices, where we have primary control shifting from one device to another depending on our context. And we know this concept already from the good old-fashioned car phone, right? So if you're driving down the auto route, you get a call on your, your Bluetooth-connected phone, it's not actually your phone that rings. Your car rings. Obviously, the logic, again, it's all happening on the phone. But the interaction is happening with my car, which has its own computer system and its own sort of stuff going on. So I'm going around, I'm talking to my car, and I get out of my car, and just keep on talking, right? The, inter the point of interaction follows me. The point of control seamlessly follows me. Well, we've sort of seen that for a while. We don't think that much about it. But it doesn't really happen very much with the other devices in our lives, right? Where it just sort of knows to follow me, the point of interaction. You know, so that when you park, the interface migrates with you. So the car had control over the car, even though it's coming through the phone. We had this invisible shift of control from one device to another. Seamless, effortless, didn't have to ask for it. Uh, again, there are surprisingly few experiments along these lines in the devices that we carry now, but there are a few of these social hardware interfaces. And as usual, it seems to be games and toys leading the way. It's sort of game designers, toy designers, the best interaction designers we have on the planet. Who's a game designer? Got any? You guys, we need to get some of those in here. There's one. Follow that guy. 
because that's where the, the experimentation happens. That's where people say, hey, these things are possible. Low risk, it's just a game, right? So we see things like this. Scrabble tried this out just a year or two ago. And here we have two, iPad, or two iPhones sharing control over the single game happening on the iPad, flipping tiles out onto the board, moving them around. The control is shifting among three devices. It just sort of feels really effortless and familiar. And there you have it, the world's most expensive board game, ladies and gentlemen. But frankly, the most interesting stuff is yet to come, and it may not be a long wait. Uh, Corning, as you may be familiar, is a glass company. They're the ones who make Gorilla Glass, the really durable glass that's on the front of most of your phones and tablets. Uh, so they're very excited about what's been going on. Screens everywhere, this is great for us. Yay, go Corning, more glass. So they made a concept video called Day Made of Glass, they wish, right? I don't usually like concept videos because usually they're a little pie in the sky, they kind of gloss over a lot of convenient facts, like I don't know whether something is possible, how expensive it is. What's interesting about this is they kind of went back after they made it and narrated over to sort of say, this is stuff we can do, this is stuff we can't quite do, but we're close, this is stuff we can do, but it's super expensive. So I want to sort of show a few things. I think there's some interesting ideas here that, that relate to what I've been talking about. So let's start with this girl who's using a tablet in her bedroom. Now, I'm not sure if you noticed, but this closet door is actually a display driven by Amy's tablet. All the intelligence that you see on this display, all these apps, they're all residing and running on Amy's tablet. This display spans the entire door. It has its own small footprint operating system and is smart enough to be aware of Amy's device. And based upon proximity and other rules, it knows what to display and in what format. To make this part of Amy's day a reality, Corning is helping to deliver large-scale edge-to-edge -edge displays. Corning looks to partners for operating systems and apps that seamlessly scale and transfer between tablets and larger displays. Oh, is that all creepy British guy hanging out in a little girl's bedroom? Is that all we need? We got it nailed, except for the operating system and the apps that can seamlessly scale from this up to this, right? Piece of cake, we're almost there. Obviously, this is hard to do. But the interesting thing is that we've already got these displays with just enough intelligence to run an interaction that is driven by something like this. You know, now we just have to write the software for it. That's where we come in, right? Uh, and what's interesting about this, right, is that this is the device that already has all of my apps, all of my bookmarks, all of my personal information. I can carry it with me throughout the day and engage with whatever screen I happen to come across or other input device, right? So this is, I think, you know, I think the, the vision of the future that I suspect is going to keep everything in line. It's smart devices talking to dumb ones, you know? So, What's interesting about this, right, is that uh, Corning, of course, will like to expand it beyond sort of this, this stereotypical, this trope of the giant bedroom, bathroom mirror that we often hear about in these kinds of things. Uh, and they think that it could be just about anywhere. This is Sarah, Amy's sister. Her tablet is just like Amy's. It's her primary computing device, too. Uh-oh, this looks like mischief. This dashboard is made from formed, thin, durable glass. It feels better than plastic and it looks better too. It's also a display, which means it can take on the appearance of pretty much anything. Of course, in driving mode, its function is to display critical and ancillary driving information. We were talking about the tricorder earlier, now we're talking about the holodeck, right? I mean, surfaces that morph into anything we want, controlled by the devices that we carry every day. Now this shit is expensive, right? This is like, this is in the labs, we can do this, not anywhere near production ready, right? So this is sort of a, a vision that's a ways off. So when does it show up? Well, this guy would tell you 20 years, not necessarily 20 years from now, but 20 years from when this stuff kind of first emerged in a lab. This is Bill Buxton, if you're not familiar with him, he's sort of one of these guys where you say, you heard of computers? That guy. Among other things, he and his team in 1985 invented the capacitive touchscreen. Uh, the same thing that's now on all these devices that we carry. Interestingly, sort of went big about 20 years later. His 
theory, he posits that it takes about 20 years from the moment an idea is conceived in the lab to when it can go big, when it can go mass market. And obviously not all breakthroughs in the lab ever become mass market, but the ones that do, it takes about 20 years. And what's interesting about this, you guys, is the thing that's going to be big in 15 years, it's been sitting in a lab for 15. The thing's going to be big in five years, it's been sitting in the lab for 15. The thing's going to be big next year, already been around for two decades. This stuff is, doesn't emerge whole cloth out of nowhere. You know, it's all lying around waiting for us to look for the pieces. And a lot of those pieces, as I've been saying, are already in our pocket or in our living rooms. Entertainment and information devices we already have that are now ready for us to do literally magical things. I'll show you one example. This is uh, my friend Aral Balkan. Uh, he looks a little tired here because this is right at the end of uh, a hackathon. I don't know if you guys have done a hackathon. You know, these are exciting but grueling events. Overnight, let's make something. If you know Aral, you won't be surprised to know that he's done this right. He's uh, on a yacht in Cannes, France, is where they had this hackathon. You see these bottles of wine in the back, right? So if you're going to do a hackathon, this is the way to do it, by the way. So he, took, uh, he brought with him a Kinect, an iPhone, a Mac, and a projector. And, you know, overnight, sipping some wine, he made this hack. So you're sitting at home on your sofa, watching television, and something interesting comes on. And you want to share it, say, tweet it. So um, I walk up to my TV, and I just kind of wave at it so it knows I'm there. Um, and then when something interesting comes up, I can just grab it. What? Boom, put it over there. I grab, and boom, I put it over there. So I'm just holding it in my hand, and I'm putting it on my phone. Yes! That's my hand. Right. I don't know, just put it together in a few hours. You know why? Because it's not that hard. I don't mean to make light of this hack, but it's just these basic components with established APIs. He taught the Kinect to recognize this gesture, take a screenshot, and then, you know, you can walk around with it like he's got it in his fist, just holding on to it. And then, you know, touch the screen to release it. Super simple interaction. But again, it's the combination of these inputs that make it seem magical, as well as the interaction that goes off screen. And importantly, this is not, you know, this is another example of one smart device coordinating with another smart device, migrating control at appropriate times to move content as well as behavior and intent from device to device, right? And I think this idea of sharing content is something that we still have to work on a lot. You guys, you know, some of you had a Palm Pilot, I'm sure, like 10 years ago. Remember how easy it was to exchange content with those things? You just like beam a, con a, a contact or a calendar to somebody, somebody right next to you. Somehow we lost that easy ability to transfer content from one device to another in the same room. We're great at doing it between devices on the other side of the planet. But we've, we're bad now at doing it for devices next to each other. I can have my phone and my laptop, two really capable devices, and I put them next to each other and I stand back and nothing happens. Totally antisocial. They just ignore each other, right? And that's something we've got to get better at, you guys. Uh, so I think one of the things, and this is an intriguing, kind of fun, whimsical example of it, is how do we exchange information between devices that are right adjacent to each other? Here's sort of one kind of fun idea. Some, a few design students in California put together this video uh, about three years ago now of paper prototypes for how smart devices, touch devices, might interact. And so they looked at what screen-based gestures might evolve. So that's cute, that's kind of fun, right? That's kind of cutesy, but it's gonna be a while before you know, we're gonna be shaking and scraping content from one device to another, right? Except we've already got it. And again, toys show the way here. These little gadgets called Siftio Cubes, kids' toys, that are smart enough to recognize each other's proximity. They say hello, unlike my phone and laptop. They've got little accelerometers in them, so I can literally tip information from one to another. The software runs on a laptop or via a Wi-Fi hub, talks to the devices that way, and then you can combine them and, and play little games and software. 
little puzzle games. Oh, and they love it when you buy more cubes. Yeah, they love that. And the gameplay gets more sophisticated too, right? Because now you can do a lot more combinations with these things when you have a few different cubes. Word games, when seven or eight cubes, really engaging, difficult. Why can this toy do this and my phone and laptop can't? So again, you know, looking to toys, looking to games for the real interactions that are possible with the technologies that we already have today. That's where we have to look. Uh, what I, one thing also that I want to point out about these little guys is that you know, they kind of get the software as they need them. Um, Stephanie Rieger, who's one of the smartest folks I know who thinks about mobile stuff, uh, in addition, of course, to all the folks here in this room, uh, talks about the just-in-time web or I'm sorry, the, in, in, in how we've got just sort of a just-in-case web right now where we just shovel stuff up onto our websites, right? You guys know. It's just, uh, people, it's just, let's not make the hard decision. Let's just shovel it all onto the website. Somebody's going to want this stuff. Uh, Jeremy is, has this great line where he sort of says, you know, as screen sizes have gotten larger, we've taken his permission just to fill them with crap, right? As we've got, they got bigger and bigger, it's like, oh, we've got room for another column. That right column on every website, full of crap, right? You know it, we build these things, we're the ones who pour the crap in there. Just in case, right? And it's true of our phones, too. Filled with apps, clogged with apps. We have to weed them out, garden them, just to be able to use them. Because we've downloaded these things just in case. What we need is a just-in-time web, you know? And a just-in-time uh, just software, too, right? Where we can grab the software, use it, discard it. We have this with music and movies increasingly. Keep the media at bay until we need it. As you start to do this, start to have intelligent software that downs it, loads itself when you need it, it starts to get pretty matrix, right? Not yet. Operator. Tank, I need a pilot program for a B-212 helicopter. Hurry. Let's go. She is such a badass, right? There you go. Gratuitous Matrix clip, you're welcome. Uh, so, you know, in, in that kind of basic, almost reflexive intelligence of, of machines that are smart enough to grab software when they need it, brings us to the next stop as we move even further out into uh, the near future of computing, from migrating interfaces out to passive interfaces, right? And what I mean by this is devices that just do their work and talk to one another without even needing us to intervene. If devices are already smart enough to talk to each other, to share control, then hey, they can start doing it on their own too, right? Where we're incidental to their behavior. We're just the legs that bring them into proximity. And we're seeing these things on the consumer market now, right? Many of you are probably familiar with the Nest thermostat designed by Tony Fidel, one of the first one of the designers of the, uh, of the first iPod, the, who led the design of the first iPod. This is a thermostat, right? But it's loaded with these sensors to do its job expertly, and I would say beautifully. Uh, proximity sensors to know when you're home, humidity sensor, temperature sensor, of course. It's got Wi-Fi, an internet connection to get the weather outside. Talks to apps and websites. You can remote control your house's temperature from anywhere on the web. And you guys, it's a thermostat, right? Again, trivially inexpensive to add these kinds of things to the most mundane devices. And what's interesting, right, is that it's able to sync with the smart devices that we have. You know, we've got these loaded, dumb devices uh, and it, that are an important piece of our future. We have, for example, the Nike Fuel Band. You wear it on your wrist. It tracks your activity throughout the day. It's not super smart, right? It just gives you these points for your motion. But then it talks to your phone or your computer or your tablet whenever it comes into contact. It pairs when it can. It communicates when it can. Now, it has its own display here, right? Not much, but you could probably show some news headlines on there if you wanted to. It doesn't but you could. A relatively dumb computer with a dumb sensor with a dumb display, but that talks on its own to the machines around it. Lumo, another example. This is, was a Kickstarter project. Seeing a lot of Kickstarter Internet of Things projects. Again, inexpensive, grassroots projects. This is a sensor that goes on your lower back and detects when you're slouching and buzzes to tell you to stand up straight. It's like having your mom follow you around, right? 
Really simple interface, binary interface, buzzing, not buzzing. But it also has a device API. You can talk to your phone, and you can build your own apps to monitor human movement. And speaking of dumb devices and CES earlier in January, the Happy Fork was unveiled. This is a thing that monitors how much and how quickly you eat and buzzes and flashes when you're eating too fast. Don't gobble your food, it tells you, right? But it has this thing that, again, it can talk to devices around it, to the web, and sort of get this overall sort of uh, sense of what your well-being and, and eating habits are. My point is not that we have a future of nagging devices. Stand up straight. Stop gobbling your food. But that we need a change in perspective on how technology evolves. It's a theme we've heard throughout the day. You know, we, need to, we tend to, to think that our devices are always going to keep getting smarter, ever more sophisticated better browsers, bigger screens, faster processors, and that is certainly part of our future. But in fact, devices are just as likely to get dumber, and that's a good thing, and that's just beginning. You know, dumb devices doing work for us, talking to the handful of smart devices we actually interact with. Now, the interfaces of these dumb devices, as we've seen, can be very simple, possibly without screens at all. We have to figure out what communicating with them means. We don't really know that yet. Uh, we heard John say, pay attention to the little guy, talking about all kinds of dumb devices with browsers in them. Uh, and Anna showed us lots of cons consoles and low-spec gadgets browsing the web. Let's look at a few more that sort of really push the limits of this. Uh, Philips makes a new Wi-Fi-enabled light bulb called Hue. Uh, Martin Kuhl, who's talking tomorrow, worked on this project a bit. Now, these things connect to a little Wi-Fi hub that you can in, in turn control via web or app. Right? So you can adjust the lighting from anywhere in the world. So highly recommend letting someone stay in your home and then, you know, screwing with them. There's a ghost, whatever. World's most expensive replacement for the clapper. But that's not all it does, right? Is that you can also choose colors from photos and the light will change to match the hue. Now this might sound like sort of a novelty. And in this case, you know, it is. It's sort of like this is for my groovy bachelor pad. But, this, but it, it, it's really interesting when it happens at scale. In uh, the summer of 2011, the city of Westminster in London approved the upgrade of 14,000 streetlights to internet-controlled lighting, little Wi-Fi light bulbs, right? They can actually dim the city's light from an iPad. I mean, who knows what happens when that gets hacked? But they've already, they're already saving a million pounds a year from this system by saving on energy. So as component parts become cheaper, Wi-Fi in a light bulb, as I said, it becomes trivially inexpensive to connect just about anything, often without a screen, like a light bulb, like the Lumo, like the Happy Fork, or with a very simple screen like Fuel Band or Nest, or get this, you guys, yep, credit cards with screens and keyboards. Visa and MasterCard both have these things on the market. Visa unveiled theirs and here in Europe in 2010, MasterCard unveiled theirs in Singapore, uh, just this past November. The idea is to make online payments more secure by ensuring you're holding the actual card, not, a stolen, not stolen card numbers. So you make up a numeric password and type it into the card, and then you type that same number into a web interface. And speaking of little displays, we heard earlier about the Pebble. There's obviously a ton of rumor about what, might, what this might be, an iPhone, smartwatch, Samsung and Microsoft have said they're working on the same stuff. You guys, how does your app website or app look on this? How should it look? Probably not exactly like a website, but we should be able to get information on it. This is something that Kenneth was talking about. Or a 10-character LED display on a credit card or a fuel band. Or by speech, how does your website sound? That's something that you're supposed to have been concerned about. Many of us gloss over that one. You know, so how do we allow people to experience our, our information, our services on such incredibly different devices? And right now, we're badly equipped for this. Our content is a mess, full of presentation, legacy, systems. You know, how do we design content experiences for devices we haven't even imagined yet? Frankly, we've got to get back to starting with our content. You guys, your API is the application here. It's the underlying service that we have to concentrate on, the format of the raw content. Make sure that it's chunked up and well-described, stripped of presentations, so that even dumb devices can take the content they need and present it appropriately. Because if we can do a better job of structuring our content, describing it, delivering it to any device, 
We've got these meaningful APIs that let any device grab the content that they want and display it in an appropriate way. We have to care about how content is created, stored, transported. And many of us in this room probably are responsible for that. But for those of you who are designers or editors or product managers, it's time for you to care about it too, because that's how we get creative control in an uncertain world. These are the working materials for designers. The smaller you can get the content and the, the more neutral you can get it in terms of format, the more we can put it to all these devices that I'm describing. And it means that it'll make our own job easier too because we can let the robots do the work for us. If we can describe the information with appropriate metadata and well-structured, the machines can put together the interfaces that we need. One quick example, and then I'll let you guys have some beer. The Guardian, like a lot of newspapers, has a lot of information embedded in its front page design. Right? So we know just from using these things that this article here on the top left, the Greece article, is the most important. One with a photo, second. Article below, third. Even though they're at the top, we know that those are four, five, and six. Right? Just from the conventions of layout. The trouble is when we move that content to other platforms, digital platforms, we often lose that information, that editorial judgment. Uh, I don't know, I guess, you know, latest chronological will do, you know, show the latest stories at the top instead of the most important. Somehow this stuff doesn't always translate very well. And so the solution is that a lot of newspapers, for example, make is, well, let's have an editor and a designer for each edition we create, which was fine when there were one or two platforms. But now that there are a bajillion, it's a lot harder to pull off, right? So when The Guardian, made their iPad app, which, as you see, looks uniquely iPad. It's its own sort of design, but it still reflects the same order of the stories. There's a lot more content here on the iPad than, than on the physical front page, but you can still see that they're all represented. They didn't hire a separate editor. They had the robots build it. They had an automated script, analyze the InDesign files, all XML under the hood, for the print edition, for location and size, and assigned a priority number to each of those and drove that back into the CMS. So that then the robots could say, oh, I know what's most important, and just build that edition for us. And the result is an app that's uniquely iPad, but carries the meanings and values of print. And that data can go on to serve any platform. So our final stop on this journey lands us here, in the cloud. And I'm not talking about the cloud that's on all the airport billboards. I'm talking instead, although that's important, you know, the web, the cloud, it's going to be super important for sort of being the clearinghouse for all this information, some of which will be shown in a browser, others through these other devices and new platforms. But the cloud I'm talking about is a cloud of social devices. You take all these trends, sensors, mirroring, remote control, migrating control, and passive interfaces, and you have a set of truly social devices that are in our face when we need them and out of the way when we don't, but still doing our work. So that means we're doing a lot more than building applications, you guys, or websites. I'm using applications in the broadest sense, apps, websites, you name it. Those things are just the container. What we're doing, the important thing that we do, is we build services. You have to think beyond these single interfaces. That's what occupies us, though. Many of us came here thinking, oh, I've got to figure out how to design for this class of device. I'm working on this project. It's killing me. I've got to find some solutions to it. That's natural. That's what, that's what we build, and those containers are really important. It's what our customers see. But they're also temporary. We throw these things out every couple of years. Technique deprecates. Presentation deprecates. The way we built websites three years ago, out the door, replace it. Even faster with apps. Service and content is more lasting. So think about services, design services, whole systems that can support lots of devices because that's the way to prepare for this future of social devices without going insane, as either designers or consumers. So what I've tried to do here is to pull together the themes that we see now. And this is imperfect. Making these connections is hard. Steve Jobs said that you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. Still, this stuff is here now, either in our pockets or in labs about to be released. And I think we can see enough of the coming changes that we can see what we have to start building now to be ready in three or five years. So we started here with where we are now. I want to return there and just sort of give some last advice, 
for how we can prepare for this immediate future. The first is just to push sensors, push the frontiers of what they're able to do, not only to interpret our environment around us, but to actually move the interaction off the screen. Think social, and man, for once, I'm not talking about Facebook and Twitter. Think about social devices. How can we have devices interact seamlessly, both in terms of content and control? Pay attention to your ecosystem. You know, sure, we, we're creating all these different applications or websites, but how are, how are we feeding those? What's your central system that you're using that can adapt to this really chaotic present, let alone the future that's bound to be even more so? We're all cloud developers now. You know, even the most mundane applications and websites need to reside in the cloud. You know, there's often this, this whole debate about web apps versus native apps, and that's an important debate to have for us, for the builders, for the people who have to pay to maintain these things. But you know, our, our customers don't care. To paraphrase Brad Frost from earlier, our users don't give a shit, right? It's, a, it's an implementation detail as far as they're concerned. But the important thing is that it all converges in the cloud, behavior and content. So we also need to think about how the API is the application. Design the content. Everyone needs to get involved with this. We need to drive our design skills down, into the, down the stack, into the content itself, because that's our working materials for creating new-to-the-world applications. And we're going to have all these new input methods. They're right here. They're right about to come through. And it's not going to be just designing independent interfaces for each of those, but the combinations. And that is going to be amazing and impossibly hard. And it's going to be a lot of fun to do. And the future is here already, you guys. We've got all the working materials. I'm not talking about some crazy science fiction vision here. It's now, and we can do it now. We are living in one of the most exciting moments in the history of technology. You guys, we have the best job ever. And maybe in the most exciting moment in the history of culture, too, because we can use that technology to do amazing things. So what I'd like you to do for the rest of the day here at the conference is talk to each other about how you can build something amazing. And go get them. Thanks, you guys. Thank you.